Continuing in our series that we've been in for a couple of weeks now, uh, where we're talking about the armor of God. And we're looking at this armor of God that Paul presents to us in the book of Ephesians, what it meant at the time that Paul was saying these words, but more so how it still has a purpose for our lives today and in the battles that are going around us each and every day. And by way of review this morning, I want to just start by rereading uh, the verses where we hear the Apostle Paul presenting to us the armor of God. And this is in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at the 10th verse, and you can follow along on the screen behind me. But here he writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted for the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And so there we see the full presentation of the armor that God equips us with through his Holy Spirit. And this morning, we're going to take some time to focus on what I think is sometimes the forgotten piece of any set of armor. But it's no less important, and it's still just as vital, and that is the shoes or the footwear that is worn. Because just like the rest of the armor of God, we need our gospel-sealed, faith-filled shoes of peace, as Paul calls them, shoes of peace, if we're going to stand firm in this world. Now, I want to tell you something this morning. I want to be a little honest with you all. I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with, with shoes. Now, as far as the love part goes, I love shoes. I think shoes are fun. I think they're unique. I think it's a fun way to express some of your taste. If I'm buying runny shoes, I want them to be as brightly colored as they can be, maybe even borderline obnoxious. When it comes to dress shoes, you know, you got to have a black pair, you got to have a gray pair, and you need at least a couple different shades of brown to match with your outfits. There's, of course, work boots, and there's winter boots, and there's sandals, and although it's really hard for me to admit publicly, Publicly, after I turned 40 a couple years ago, I did end up buying a pair of Crocs. Uh, it's not my proudest moment, but I will admit they are practical. They are comfortable for around the house. So I love shoes and all the different varieties, but the part that I don't always love is purchasing new shoes. You know, I've got my old ones just how I want them. They're all worn in. I'm comfortable with them. In fact, there was one time not too long ago I wore uh, my, my black dress shoes to church on a Sunday morning. Now, there's nothing really out of the ordinary there, but as I walked up to begin the 8.30 service, I felt something strange in my heel, and they were actually beginning to fall apart in real time as I walked up these very stairs. And throughout that entire morning, you could probably see a trail of everywhere that I have been as there were little pieces of black heel debris all over the church. I tried to pick it up the best I can, and I tried to mask this wardrobe malfunction the best I could, but I probably looked a little strange hobbling around with a limp due to my old dilapidated shoes. I have a tendency to push the lifespan of my shoes a little bit, because there is no doubt that I desperately needed to buy a new pair of shoes, but again, for whatever the reason, shopping for shoes can always seem like a little bit much for me. Sometimes it's the expense, Right? We know cheap shoes don't last very long. A good pair of shoes is well worth the money for the comfort and the sturdiness of it. There's also all the different options. It can be kind of overwhelming to make up your mind. And as I said, there's that whole comfort gamble we take with a new pair of shoes. It's one thing to slip them on and walk up and down the aisle a couple times at the store. Your toes, your heels, your feet, they might feel fine then, but it's a whole different ball game when you have to wear those shoes for six, seven, eight hours for the first time. Doesn't feel quite as comfortable until they're broken in. 
But I say all this to say this. There is one pair of shoes that I don't need to worry about. There is one pair of shoes that you don't need to worry about because they fit perfectly every time we slip them on. They're comfortable. They don't pinch your toes. They do not wear out. And the only trail they leave behind is one of God-centered assurance. And these are the God-given shoes of the gospel of peace that the Apostle Paul presents to us today. You know, those verses that we read from Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul does a brilliant job, thank you, Holy Spirit, of likening our spiritual armor to that of a Roman soldier's armor. Because just as a soldier needs to be armed and ready at all times for whatever may come their way, so does a follower of Christ. As followers of Christ, we need to be prepared for whatever spiritual darts or arrows or battles that the enemy tries to throw at us. And I think it's important for us to to note and to acknowledge, not just in this space, but to acknowledge each and every day that indeed we are in a battle, that we have an enemy. Now, it's not a physical battle. It's not against flesh and blood in this world, but rather it's in the spiritual realm. There is a spiritual enemy. There's a battle at wage, at war for our hearts, for our minds, for our very souls. And that's a reality of our lives each and every day. And so far, as we've gone through this series, we've talked a little bit about the the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation. And again today, we're looking at the words where Paul says that we are to have our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace fitting our feet with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Now, I don't know about you in these summer months and with the weather being good, it's kind of nice to go barefoot around the house, around the yard. If you've been to the beach at all, it's always good to go barefoot at the beach. But, you know, we certainly would not advise wandering around barefoot on, well, let's say a battlefield or a construction site or even almost anywhere around in public, we know that there are just some situations in which we need to not only wear shoes or good shoes, but we need to wear the right shoes, maybe even some steel-toed boots for our protection. Well, spiritually, the Christian life, it's kind of like one of those situations. I mean, let's think about it. How can a soldier advance on a battlefield or stand firm for any given length of time without shoes? I mean, we can answer that question. It's that they can't and they won't. In fact, during the time of the Apostle Paul, the shoes that were worn by the soldiers of the Roman Empire were called calugi, calugi. And they were specifically designed to keep soldiers' feet healthy during the rigors of long force marches And they were very, very different from the footwear or the sandals that would have been worn by most of the populace at that time. These shoes were constructed from three layers of leather, which were pulled up and laced around the ankle. The Calugi helped protect against things like blisters and other foot diseases, which would become quite a serious problem for soldiers at that time. And in addition to that, they would put small spikes or even iron hobnails that they would drive into the soles of the shoes underside in order to give them a firm footing on the uneven trails or terrain that they would be walking or battling on. You know, a soldier's shoes, they really did form the foundation of the rest of their armor. Because in those days, the foot soldiers of the Roman Empire, they relied on walking as their primary means of transportation. So the ability to move them easily, swiftly, and comfortably was a vital necessity for the generals. And in addition, they needed to be able to step out into battle without having to think about where they were going to place their feet. They needed a solid footing in order to concentrate on the battle at hand. And those hobnails in their shoes made it easier to hold their ground or to navigate through that rocky terrain. See, the shoes of the Roman soldier, they provided a firm foundation, a firm foundation for the battles that raged around them. Well, it's the same way with our spiritual shoes. And Paul calls them the shoes 
of peace. Shoes of the gospel of peace. See, when a believer in Jesus' foundation is God's peace, it's much easier to move about, to navigate, or to stand firm for long periods of time. And no matter how long we've lived, I think we've all lived long enough to know that perseverance and stamina are, are needed to follow Christ on this side of eternity. And our shoes of peace provide that necessary support. But on the flip side, on the flip side, one of the quickest ways for that enemy, the enemy that's raging war in each and every one of our hearts and our minds, one of the quickest ways for the enemy to render us useless is to steal our peace, to steal the confidence that we find in our peace, leaving us worried, leaving us anxious, leaving us afraid. You know, if I had a penny for every time a strong Christian person told me they were anxious, if I had a penny for every time I felt that way, I'd be wealthy. I mean, I've made it clear I'm a world-class worrier. I know a thing or two about anxiety, and I know this. Every time that anxiousness looms larger than God in my life, I begin to find myself paralyzed in my thoughts, in my worries, and in my fears. See, when I'm worried about the outcome of a situation, I can think of nothing else but my circumstance, which means I'm certainly not thinking about advancing God's kingdom in this movement. Instead, I'm stuck in that web, and I think we all know it, that web of apprehension, that unending game of what-if scenarios. And it's in those moments that the enemy has me right where he wants me, and that is distracted, that is distraught, and that is disabled from effective kingdom-building work. See, it's in those moments that I know I need peace, that we need God's peace, and we need it quickly. Yet all too often we begin our mornings by skipping the important step of putting on our gospel-sealed, faith-filled shoes of peace or any other part of the armor of God for that matter. And as a result, when we do that, we begin to feel and see that that anxiety or that worry or that fear begins to rule over our thoughts and our hearts like an eight-foot-tall taskmaster who's watching our every move. But if we are to equip ourselves with the shoes of the gospel of peace, let's ask ourselves, what did Jesus say to us about peace? What did he say about his peace? Well, in the gospel of John, the 14th chapter, he says this, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Powerful words. Harder to embrace every day, but powerful words. You know, the Apostle Paul went into further detail about the peace that's found in Christ by stating this in Ephesians 2 at the 14th verse. He says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. And he goes on to say in verse 17 that he, Jesus, came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. So how did Christ teach and preach about this peace? Oh, it's through what we call the gospel. It's through the gospel. He preached and showed us what this peace is all about through the very way he lived his life perfectly. The way that he treated people with compassion and value as God's children. It's through the gospel of Jesus, the way that he lived, but also through the good news of his death, of his burial and his resurrection on our behalf. We know and can stand firm in the truth that it's by grace through faith in Jesus that we are no longer at odds with God, but rather we are reconciled to him. Our position, our position in Christ is one of peace. But friends, is that always our state of mind? Is that always our state of mind? You know, Paul says in Colossians 3 to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. In other words, let it be at the forefront of your mind. 
Let it be what's on our feet, no matter where we go or what we encounter. You know, I think we all know and can relate to the fact that the human mind does not enjoy turmoil. And if we do not look to God for his peace, we will naturally look to find relief elsewhere. We will look to things like food or substances or relationships or pleasure or things or desires or anything else that we can substitute to help calm the mayhem that's brewing within us. And the truth is that when we do that, we always come up empty-handed anytime we search for peace anywhere other than God. Because Jesus alone is the keeper of peace. Jesus alone is the one who offers peace, as Paul says in Philippians, that surpasses our human understanding. It's a peace that begins and ends with Jesus and Jesus alone. Friends, I want us to see today that the only way we can cling to peace in a troubled world, in troubled moments of our life, is to cling to Christ, is to cling to Christ. Jesus said in John 16, I have told you these things, this gospel of peace that he's preaching, this gospel life that he lives, so that in me you may have peace. And he reminds us that in this world we will have trouble, but then tells us to take heart, to take heart because I have overcome the world. Again, the only way to cling to peace in a troubled world in our troubled moments, is to cling desperately to Christ. Because if we cling to any other hope, it will leave us all too familiar with that horrible feeling in our bellies. You know, there's certainly a lot of uncertainties in our world. It's been that way for decades. But there are certainly a lot of uncertainties in our world right now. And I think this message and this reminder that we find from the uh, Apostle Paul is an important one for our very lives today. Because in many ways, it's easy to feel and to think that perhaps peace is just a, a thing of the past. You know, there are so many things that we could spend time worrying about, but all that does is give us that heartburn and that distraction that the enemy wants in our lives. And the truth is that there are certainly many things for us to pray about. But friends, we have nothing to worry about because God is still God. He is still in control. We are still his children, and he is still trustworthy. God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, as much as I would love to see a a resurrection of biblically-centered policies and godly leadership across the globe, the true life-changing answer to our problems is not in those individuals. It's not in those hopes. It's in Jesus. It's in Jesus. And our gospel shoes never have and never will go out of style, no matter what's happening in the world, no matter what's happening in our lives. And I can promise you that the enemy will shake and quake in the presence of every believer that's dressed and ready with the gospel of peace in their lives. And yet I know that there are times when I look around, there are times when I look at my own life, at my own heart, and I don't always see that peace at the forefront of our hearts, of our minds. I don't always see peace-filled believers ready to share the gospel, and again, myself included. Instead, oftentimes I think it's too easy to see us living scared lives. The enemy has us fighting spiritually barefoot, distracted by the mayhem around us. He has us more concerned about the physical realities of this life rather than our spiritual destinies. And I'm not saying that we can't voice biblical insight and wisdom on on current topics or moments in our lives or things across our world. We can. We can. And we should. But we should also take a hard look at what is our primary concern. And ask ourselves, do they have anything to do with the gospel of peace that Jesus calls us to? Because I know this, in the midst of all this uncertainty, in the midst of hardships and uncertainties in our own personal circumstances, it's all too easy to lose sight 
of our true foundation. We may find ourselves more concerned with the chaos around us than we are with the gospel that brings real, lasting peace. And the enemy knows this. The enemy knows this all too well and loves to use it to keep us distracted, to keep us fearful, to keep us spiritually unprepared. But even as we wrestle with these distractions, we must always remember that our true hope is not in this world. Our true hope is found in Christ, in Christ alone. Because no matter what's in store for us on this side of heaven, we have so much to look forward to in Christ, here and in eternity. We have so much to look forward to, and that's the message that we need to preach. We need to remind ourselves and our world what a joy it is to live at peace with God, even amidst present circumstances, even amidst the difficulties that we face in this world. That is how we take heart in the fact that Jesus has overcome this world. Because again, this world is not our home. And I don't know about you, but that alone gives me peace. In fact, our biggest problem, the biggest problem that we could ever face as Christians, as humanity, has already been taken care of. Our biggest problem, which is separation from God due to our sin, is taken care of in Christ. Because in Jesus, we are forgiven. We are cherished, we are known, and we are loved, and God has and will continue to grant his peace. The question is, will we wear it like a pair of steel-toed boots so that no matter where we go, no matter what we come up against, we won't be anxious about the size of the circumstances or the tension? See, the enemy would love nothing more than to see us fret to leave us stumbling around in the darkness of his world with our bare feet scratching and blistering and stubbing our toes. But God gave up everything through Jesus so that we don't have to. So brothers and sisters, it is my hope, it is my prayer that when we feel the anxiousness of circumstances, of lives, of our world looming large, that we can take heart as Jesus commanded that we can put on our gospel-sealed, faith-filled shoes of peace, especially in the time of hardship, especially in the time of uncertainty. Because as we lace those shoes up together, we know who holds this world. And he is our Savior. He is our Jesus. He is our rock and our cornerstone. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you today for the reminder of your presence in our lives. Lord, I thank you for the reminder of the way your Holy Spirit continues to equip us with the armor that you've given us as a daily pursuit. And Lord, we recognize that there is a battle around us each and every day, a battle in our minds, a battle for our thoughts, a battle for our hearts and for our affections. And Lord, I pray that you help us to start each day with that firm foundation planted under our feet, to start each day with the gospel of your peace for us to stand strong upon. Help us to remember that your peace is not just a feeling, but it's a, a force, a power, Lord, that we can't even understand, that keeps us grounded, that keeps us steady, that keeps us secure in you and your promises for our lives. So, Lord, we ask today that you unite each and every one of us, Lord, as your church, Lord, I pray that this peace and your gospel, your truth for our lives begin to break down any divisions that may hinder our witness and testimony to the world. Father, teach us to live out the peace that you have given us in each and every one of our relationships. Lord, help us to live it out and embrace it throughout our communities and in our daily lives. Lord, I pray that each and every heart here, each and every heart united to you today across the world, be a testimony to the peace that we have in you, that your peace is real, that your peace and presence transforms our lives and our hearts, and that it makes a difference as we lock our eyes on you. 
And Lord, as we prepare to leave this place today, Lord, I pray that you help us again to put on these shoes of peace. Empower us to stand firm together, unified in your kingdom purposes, and boldly advancing where you lead us in your wisdom. Father, may your peace rule in our hearts and guide us in every step that we take. Lord, I just pray that you continue to use us as instruments, as ambassadors, as your hands and your feet, as your heart in this world to bring your light into the darkness and to share your good news and your hope with all of those who are lost and hurting. Father, we thank you. And it is in the powerful name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, that we pray. Amen. I invite you to lift your voices. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy Say